I studied filmmaking in the U.S. during the 70s. Recently, I've been doing talk shows on the voiceless dissidents, those that deserve to be heard but are silenced by the corporate media. The Treasury Department of the present Trump administration sanctioned me and my colleagues. You must have harassed them. You continue the show right here from my home. I am Nadir Talib Zadeh on Nadir's show. show. Greetings. The explosive news of Iran shooting down a super American drone over the Persian Gulf pervaded over all the news this week. I speak to three experts on the matter, Michael Malou, former Pentagon officer, along with Scott Bennett, former counterintelligence officer in the Defense Department, and Pepe Escobar, international journalist and author from Brazil. Their account of the 10 minutes that preceded the decision to de-ignite a potential war is the subject of this program. The tensions between the United States and Iran escalated after the U.S.'s withdrawal from the JCPOA, and the imposition of financial sanctions, which have been branded as economic terrorism by Iranian officials. These tensions have risen following the sanctions, which aim to bring Iranian oil exports close to zero. After imposing these sanctions suspicious attacks by unidentified agents targeted oil tankers in the Persian Gulf and Sea of Oman. The United States, Israel and some countries in the region blamed Iran for these attacks without any official proof. The downing of a U.S. drone by IRGC forces, according to the president, led him to decide to attack Iran, a decision he cancelled ten minutes later, as he said. This program is going to examine different aspects of this event with three analysts. Dr. Scott Bennett, formerly of the U.S. Army 11th Psychological Operations Battalion, attempted to blow the whistle by contacting the commercially controlled media and writing to U.S. politicians after being sacked from his job as terrorist finance investigator after he proved too zealous at the job. He has developed and managed psychological warfare theories, products, and operations for U.S. Special Operations Command, U.S. Central Command the State Department Coordinator for Counterterrorism, and other government agencies. He was a research fellow at the Heritage Foundation. Pepe Escobar is the roving correspondent for Asia Times, Hong Kong, an analyst for RT and Tom Dispatch, and a frequent contributor to websites and radio shows ranging from the US to East Asia. Born in Brazil, he's been a foreign correspondent since 1985, and has lived in London, Paris, Milan, Los Angeles, Washington, Bangkok, and Hong Kong. Michael Malou, 
a former senior security policy analyst in the office of the Secretary of Defense, has almost 30 years of federal service in the U.S. Defense Department and as a specialized trainer for border guards and special forces in select countries of the Caucasus and Central Asia. While with the Department of Defense, Maloof was Director of Technology Security Operations as head of a 10-person team involved in halting the diversion of militarily critical technologies to countries of national security and proliferation concern and those involved in sponsoring terrorism. All right, thank you so much for this uh, unique opportunity to have all the three great of you on, on the show. Uh, let me begin with the, with the oldest man here, uh, Mike Malouf. Mike, thank you for the opportunity. <laughs> Age before beauty, okay, yes, okay got it. Okay, Mike, uh, the, the, subject, the subject is this sensitive issue that has everybody mesmerized on it. And as I, I was just looking at this uh, article, and I'm going to base my whole talk on this 10 minutes to war. Uh, written in Consortium News by Joe Lauria. Uh, Mike, let me ask you, why is this event different than any other that has happened so far, that we came so close to uh, a, a war? Well, we have uh, done so before, uh, during the Cuban Missile Crisis. And uh, what's intriguing is something parallel uh, back then and now. We actually had a U-2 shot down and a pilot killed, but President Kennedy at that time actually showed restraint. And I, once again, uh, fast forward to today, it was very prudent that uh, Trump did so because he does not want a war. And he had to admit in an interview on Sunday that he's being pushed by his hawks, namely John Bolton. He says, basically, he said, John, there's a, there isn't a war that John Bolton doesn't like. He would take on the whole world at once. And he has demonstrated that. I saw it myself in 2003 when I was at the Defense Department when I briefed him. The man scared me to death. Um, okay, thank you so much, Mike. I'm going to ask Pepe the same question about 10 minutes to war. What was different about this incident and why did it explode the way it did? Well, what was different is that the Iranians read the situation faultlessly. They identified the PA, they identified the Global Hawk, they probably discussed in a matter of seconds or maybe a few minutes that this sounded like a trap. So instead of shooting a missile, a $2,500 missile against the P-8, where they would probably kill 35 Americans, thus creating the perfect casus belli for all hell breaking loose, they directed their missile to the Global Hawk and got rid of 220 million of uh, the best <laughs> cyber intelligence on the planet. And at the same time, they sent a message to the Americans that you cannot trap us, you cannot fool us. So this, compared to anything that happened before in terms of the Americans in intervening anywhere in the Global South, is unheard of. And I'm sure the Pentagon got the message. I'm not sure if Trump got the message. Trump getting the message is a completely different story. This is what I put in my, in my latest column. I wrote for a strategic culture, Russia, small think tank. It went all over the place on zero hedge. It started bombing everywhere. It's a very simple, a short column, basically rephrasing something that I had published before and some of my colleagues as well. The financial consequences of blocking the Strait of Hormuz, whatever the cause, it doesn't matter if it's a false flag, it doesn't matter, whatever, whatever the cause, it's the total implosion of the Western financial system as a whole. And this is something that I know that Trump received because some of my New York banking sources, they wrote me and saying, look, we sent a copy of your story to him. And to Jamie Dimon, to Steven Schwartzman, to Larry Fink. So all these people who are anti-war by definition, because they know what this means uh, in financial terms, they are now probably picking up the phone and calling Trump and said, don't start anything foolish. And 
obviously the financial angle is as important as the military angle. And I think Iran is scorning both angles at the same time, and that makes it unprecedented. Thank you, Pepe. Uh, Scott, continuing with what uh, Mr. Escobar was saying, what's your take on the situation? I think this is a distraction operation for a lot of the domestic issues that are starting to boil over. I personally, Nader, have been in contact with General Flynn's attorney, Sidney Powell, who I know, and I have debriefed her thoroughly on the shell game terrorist financing Saudi Arabia, Hillary Clinton, Swiss uh, Bank, Saudi, uh, State Department, Nexus. And they are giving that to the uh, attorney general and investigators and, and all who are looking into the, the Russian hoax and the attempted coup against Trump. So there are explosive uh, uh, prosecutions and evidentiary processes that are under uh, going now. And I am personally involved in that. So I say that to give backdrop that the, the coup d'etat and the civil war in America is very real. Uh, and this operation against Iran is a very convenient distraction, as Pepe said, said a uh, causes belli could have been uh, evoked and triggered and a war uh, unleashed that would have conveniently uh, allowed an escape and a cover up for a lot of the uh, criminal uh, prosecutions and things that we'll see over the next year until 2020. That being said, I really think you can see Donald Trump's heart as the president when he said, no, I'm not going to kill Iranians, 150 Iranians over a drone, a ro remote control, very expensive drone, but I'm not going to do it. It's not moral. It's not God's will. It's not the American people's will. His heart was in the right way. He is also aware that the beta male team, the B team, as Zarif calls him, which I agree, are trying desperately to push him into a war with Iran, desperately for conflict. But Trump is not following following them. He's not falling into their trap. This does create a very unique diplomatic opportunity for the Iranians to be the adults in the room and say, Mr. President, we don't want war. You don't want war. The American people don't want war. They elected you for that. Let us come together and discuss this so that it never happens again. And perhaps we can talk about JCPOA and other miscommunications, misunderstandings. We want the truth. We want to clarify things. I think that's the phone call Donald Trump is waiting for. Now is the wonderful chance for the Iranians to go around the beta team, make a phone call, make communications, because we also see that Amman did not communicate the Iranian message to America. So no one can be trusted to communicate directly to Donald Trump. Some of us are. Some of us are, are very tied in. But it's a it's an incredible siege that he's under. So the Iranians, as ironic as it sounds, need to come and present the truth to the president so that he can begin to push back against these neocon warmongers and disentangle himself from them. Thank you. Thank you so much, Scott. Um, Mike, what's your what do you think happened those few seconds before the decision was made to alter the whole thing. I mean, we, we were on the verge of something pretty big, but then what do you think dramatically happened then? Well, I, I think that uh, Bolton basically boxed in Trump, and I think he was looking for a way out. And, as, and what was stunning to me, absolutely stunning, that no one had asked the question beforehand, how many lives would be lost? That should have been something incorporated uh, in the event of in the event of a uh, of a response from the U.S. Nobody had asked that, and, and why wasn't it included in his briefing? It's just amazing to me, and it's, it really shows perhaps a total disarray in Trump's foreign policy apparatus and 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 mechanisms of of decision making. I mean, it's really scary that we almost went to war over the shoot down of a drone and, and uh, an unmanned drone. And in fact, we shouldn't even be there because you don't see you don't see Iranian drones flying around the uh, uh, Gulf Coast of the United States or up the East Coast. Norfolk would be a beautiful target for them to look at. But, but you don't see that. 
uh, but, but you know, you, you just can't rule anything out anymore. <laughs> I'm not trying to give any ideas, but I mean, if I can think of it, anybody can think of it. But the reality is we should not even be there. And, and this represents a greater problem for us in terms of our Middle East policy. And this is where I think the crux of things are. We've got this conspiracy with the Saudi Arabia and, and with and with Iran, uh, uh, Israel that's just could kill us because they want us to get into a conflict so badly. But it's uh, at, you know they want us to put our troops uh, to fight their wars. And you know I know that Trump likes Saudi money, but I don't know that he's prepared to go to war for them. And that's a front. So, I mean, we've got a major dilemma here. I mean, there doesn't seem to be a U.S. policy. And and, and, the, and the more the more we creep along here, the deeper involved we get. And I think the Iranians indeed did show restraint. They did have a choice. They could have attacked any one of the 34 bases we have out there in the Middle East. So it was basically an Iranian shot across, shot across the, our bow uh, that uh, I, I think was uh, important on the one hand and being selective in, t in, their, in its targeting simply because there probably was a case where they entered into territorial waters. Uh, and uh, otherwise, I don't think the Iranians would have shot it down. As it is, uh, we, we see Iran allowing ships to go through the straits now, even warships. They're not stopping any warships. It's not like the tanker wars of in the 80s, like we uh, uh, some of us recall. So this is a different time, a different period. And uh, and I think the United, I think what all of this demonstrates is a total lack of U.S. policy toward the Middle East and Iran in particular. And we need to come to our senses on Iran. There's just, and we need to be looking at Iran not through the prism of Israel. We need to be dealing on a bilateral basis. And unfortunately, I don't see how you undo the mistrust that now exists between the two countries. And the Supreme Leader was right. <laughs> when he was ha had that uh, discussion with Abe, the Prime Minister of Japan, he said, "Look, we had an agreement. We were we were in compliance. The United States agreed to it, and then they and then Trump himself is the one who dropped out. And how do you regain that trust to enter into anything in the future? I mean, we are really at a dilemma, and and nobody has an answer." And what I'm hoping for is that people like Putin, what have you, when they go to the G20, they can impress upon Trump to sit down and have a talk. But, you know, talking, as you know, is a two-way street. I don't know what the Iranians will do. I hope that if Trump makes a concerted effort to want to talk and demonstrate that, that there is some reciprocity somewhere uh, to at least sit down and talk. And, and hopefully there are some back channels underway now to try to affect that. Okay, thank you so much. Um, I'm going back to Pepe. Pepe, you are from Brazil and now you're in France. Tell me about the world reaction from what you have perceived about what happened. Well, uh, on Iran it's complicated because I follow Iran from an Eurasian point of view. So when I'm in Europe, I tend to see what uh, NATO is doing, essentially. I get uh, immersed in French politics, which is a <laughs> fascinating <laughs> thing to watch. And in Brazil, I am being pulled right into Brazil Gate, which is developing at the moment, which is the tropical version of Russia Gate. So uh, my life is completely schizophrenic, you know, in, in terms of uh, gauging how what happened in Iran. At in the Persian Gulf, in the Gulf of Oman, in the Persian Gulf, these past uh, two weeks in Europe, they don't have a clue. And then I'm talking about the French, the British, the Italians, the Spanish. The German media is slightly more informed. So then they, they start outlining those uh, military scenarios because uh, German intelligence, they have the numbers, usually correct, much better than the Americans, for that matter. But uh, what, what they don't understand, uh, I would say all across the West, is how Iran has managed to stare down against the superpower. They are puzzled, which is fascinating. It shows Iranian uh, resilience, of course. 
it shows uh, how uh, uh, resistance works in practice. Uh, it shows uh, a degree of military know-how and geopolitical swing, which most nations don't have. And it shows balls, especially from an actor in the global south that is able to stare down the superpower like that and for the moment getting away with it because the messages, like we talk, we've been talking, military and financial are stark. Okay, if you want to create a mess with us, you're going to suffer like uh, you have no idea. This is something that uh, the Russians are much more... Uh, indirect when they want to send a message like that to, to the Americans. And the Chinese are reactive. The Iranians are being proactive, especially for the past two weeks. And uh, mo no wonder nobody in the West understands because there is the, always this uh, uh, cliche and the stereotype of, ah, the land of the mullahs. And even when you consider that a lot of Euro well-informed Europeans, especially in France uh, and, and in Germany, they have been to Iran. They know a little bit of Iranian culture, of Persian empires, of uh, all the Islamic revolution, but they're still puzzled. But then I would like to, just to finish this uh, stretch, I would like to pose a direct question to both Michael and Scott, actually. Do you think that Pompeo is the acting uh, Secretary of Defense as we speak. And what are the ramifications of that? This means that uh, uh, the ball will stop rolling. Uh, we saw Bolton with Netanyahu yesterday, and today we saw uh, Pompeo with uh, MBS in Riyadh. So this thing won't stop. They will find other casus belli. And uh, is do you consider as a fact, as we stand, that Pompeo is running Pentagon policy over the generals? Uh, let me let me say real quickly, Pepe, I think Pompeo is an imbecile and uh, is really a puppet. And he doesn't possess the critical thinking or the flexibility of, of a worthy opponent. And I'm, I agree with you 100%. Uh, the Iranians have showed enormous fortitude and, and uh, confidence. And I would say this is the time to, to move forward for them, to advance. Do not stop diplomatic communication uh, engagements. That's how you win by showing yourself to the world that Iran is about peace, that Iran is about negotiation and engagement and conversations and, and language and meeting. Iran should go to Abe and arrange for Abe to have a meeting for Trump and Iran to come together, invite Putin. Iran needs to take the diplomatic offensive and the initiative to so that the warmongers, Pompeo and Bolton, have no uh, way to breathe. You keep them on retreat. You keep them on their heels so that they cannot come and, and try and get around you and do another attack. So this is the time for Iran to make aggressive diplomatic uh, uh, forward momentum for peace. We represent stability and peace in the world. And this is not about a drone attack. This is about a larger agenda for war that the American neocon Zionists and the military industrial complex are pushing us towards. So they need to flip the subject and say, this is not about a drone. This is about this is about an agenda. But you're right. Uh, having Pompeo appearing at Special Operations Command in MacDill, uh, which is is the joint command that is preparing for a lot of these operations is uh it's a very bad thing but it's also an incompetent thing because uh pompeo is so incompetent and they're out of touch with the american people the american people overwhelmingly do not trust pompeo or bolton they do not want war against iran and trump knows that the cooler heads in the american media like tucker carlson are the ones who influence tr trump and he is taking their influence, not the spastic schizophrenics like Sean Hannity, which makes himself look like a cheap tissue coming apart with emotional avocations and really just offensive silliness. So I'll stop there and hand it back to my esteemed colleague, Michael Ballou. OK, Mike, yeah, continue on with, with a question that Pepe put out. Pompeo being, is he the, actually the Secretary of Defense now? Secretary of Defense because we haven't had a competent Secretary of Defense there since Mattis. Mattis was the stability of that team and you have uh, 
Then you have Bolton, who is the national security advisor, but he is totally out of control. And he, and as I said earlier, he, there isn't a war he doesn't like, and that's because he's never been in one. And some of us who have been involved in wars know that's the last thing in the world you want is another war. And um, and uh, I, I just, uh, I, Pompeo is now in Saudi Arabia. He's talking to try and and what's amazing he's trying to get up a coalition against iran he he is he's trying to get them to uh put up uh to to confront somehow iran but we've already seen that saudi arabia given its experience in yemen can't work its way out of a paper bag so uh i i uh, i think that um uh it, it's really a stretch, and I think it's unrealistic the way Pompeo is going around. And it, it's clear that the world is not is no longer up to this. We've, U.S. has been involved in war for 18 straight years, and the American people are sick of it. Sick of it because there's no identification of what the value is for all of this. We uh, Iraq costs us costs the United States at least six trillion dollars what do we have to show for it nothing we've been involved with afghanistan what do we have to show for it nothing so there's got to be an alternative to war and i think trump is beginning to sense that but uh, he clearly has no strategic thinkers around him uh, at this point and he just has these little warmongers now i would say that uh, pompeo is probably the closest thing that Trump has now to a Secretary of Defense since um, Pompeo was number one in his West Point class. But <laughs> after that, uh, I don't think he's ever led troops in war. Thank you, Mike. Uh, going to Pepe, um, I'd like to ask you, did you, uh, I mean, sometimes I think in, in my imagination we would not have anticipated such an event to take place. And how surprised were you at the action and the reaction, Pepe? Uh, I was expecting the action because uh, we are now expecting one false flag a week, at least. No? So this was more than predictable. The reaction was so stunning. It was overwhelmingly stunning because it was a mix of craft and balls at the same time with a very simple operation, you know, launching a missile. Yeah, but where are you going to launch your, miss your missile and what for? And with a, a spectrum of what a few minutes to decide the right move. So this this was this was amazing. This I, I don't see. Correct me if I if I'm wrong, Scott and Michael. But I haven't seen anything remotely similar since uh, those uh, Taliban victories in the middle of Helmand Province 15 years ago or so. You know, no, nothing remotely similar. Um, there's, there's, an, there's another element, uh, changing a little bit the subject in terms of how this situation could be diffused. There was a very, very important meeting at the Shanghai Cooperation Organization Summit in Kyrgyzstan. Rouhani was there as an observer at the SCO, but everybody was there. Remember, Putin, Xi, Modi and Imran Khan. You had these five on the same room. And guess what? They were discussing Iran US in detail. We had only a few leaks here and there, you know, uh, foreign ministry and all that. But we know that the, the discussions were substantial. So maybe, just maybe, we could have the embryo of, uh, I wouldn't say a delegation, but at least uh, uh, personally, Putin, if they have their meeting on the sidelines of G20 conveying to Trump the enormity of the situation and how you united Eurasia, let's put it this way, could help Trump to get out of this mess that he created in the first place. Number one, by pulling out of the JCPOA, and number two, by nominating these assholes, sorry, Pompeo and Bolton. So maybe there is a way out in Osaka, you know, if we're trying to be extremely optimistic. <laughs> Okay, okay, thank you, Pepe. Just continuing on that uh, line, Scott, what do you have to say about that? 
I think it's uh, right that the only way to diffuse the situation is through diplomatic talks and relations, and it has to be done through intermediaries, third powers. So Japan is a great example because they've got skin in the game. No one has more credential and foundation for getting upset than Japan. But at the same time, they're not upset because they know the truth, that this was not done by Iran, and it was done by other hostile actors, probably Israel, Saudi Arabia, the United States, Britain, MI6, CIA, or a consortium of them. So Japan is in an excellent position to say, we've experienced war in Hiroshima and Nagasaki and the radiation of of uh, millions of people dead, and we don't want that for Iran or in the United States or anywhere. They have an incredible moral uh, momentum behind them, and Abe uh, is a great uh, person to uh, uh, commission for a diplomatic uh, conference or meeting, and Russia can, can be invited too because Russia and Japan share a, a certain uh, foreign policy geographical uh, involvement. So you could have Russia and Japan and Iran and perhaps leave China out of it uh, because the, the larger uh, geopolitical interest is secure Russia and Iran and the United States in peace. And that gives Russia and America uh, leverage with China. And that's, I think, a better strategic operation to undertake because Trump is going, they're, they're all going to be more excited about that. And Europe would be more excited. Trump realizes his mistake of, of pulling out of the JCPOA, as we all said, but now he's in a corner. He can't back out by his own uh, will and strength. He has to have other people reach in and pull him out of this box. And it has to be Iran. They have to be the big boys in the room. And they will win the hearts and minds of the American people by doing that. The American media, uh, uh, aside from some in Fox News, but the American media is overwhelmingly trying to broadcast this as the Zionists do as an Iranian aggression. So that's why Iranian overtures of diplomacy and uh, 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 peace will quench the fires that the Zionist media and the false flags and the neocons are trying to whip up. But it has to be done through intermediaries and third parties. And, and Iran needs to be aggressive in moving forward. Don't give the neocons time to breathe. Constantly put things on the table for them to accept that the American people in the world would accept. And every time they reject them, Trump is getting closer to removing them from his team because he will say, that sounds reasonable. That sounds good. And the neocons and Bolton and Pompeo and these warmongers, they will be put into a corner, a corner of their own fanaticism and hostility and meltdown. And, and that's the way to win. Push them away from Trump by making overtures and invitations for him like a deal he cannot refuse. Right. Uh, my, my last question to the three of you, if you can briefly answer, and I'll begin with you, Mike, is with what has happened, how gloomy or how light does the future look? Well, that is the big question right now. I, I think both both uh, countries realize that they came up to the brink of war. They came up to the brink of war, and they both stepped back. And I think that that was a, a healthy sign. Uh, the question now is, how do we get creative enough and get other players involved, particularly from Europe and, and, and Russia, to uh, weigh in now to try and get uh, talks going. I'm still bothered by the fact that, that Trump is still allowing Bolton and Pompeo to run behind his back and, and get him so uh, boxed in uh, as before that uh, he has no choice. But um, I'm hoping that uh, he that uh, that uh, more, more uh, adult uh management will take take hold here very very shortly but it was very clear that neither side wanted a war and i'm hoping that that's the way we continue and we come to a, a result at least come up with a basis for discussion but uh you know it works two ways we got it the the supreme leader has got to agree to want to have uh have a discussion and i'm hoping that uh, in light of this that um that that for both sides what happened was a wake-up call Thank you. Pepe, the same question. How gloomy or how light do you think the future forecast is? 
Uh, I think Michael covered uh, most points, in fact. Uh, I, I'm not as optimistic in say, because I'm thinking about the war party lobby that wants this war so bad, like Scott says, because it's a fabulous diversionist tactic, because a lot of people are going to make a lot of money out of this war, because this is uh, those promises that uh, Trump had to Sheldon Adelson and company, because of the nefarious uh, influence of BB, because uh, MBS is probably putting uh, maybe a lot of money on the table if there is a war against Iran, <laughs> not knowing himself MBS that uh, his um, camel farm would be incinerated in 24 hours. So this is, I, 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 okay, maybe we came to the brink, but the brink could happen over and over again. Uh, I'm not sure these people are going to give up. The, in fact, it's their only narrative at, at the moment, Iranian aggression. They cannot pull out anything against Russia and China because they are too powerful. But they think they can get away with pulling anything, <laughs> like the Pentagon says, a limit, limited war or whatever against Iran. They now know that they can't, but they'll keep racking up uh, uh, the pressure. Uh, these people are very, very dangerous, and we all know it. And uh, my American friends know it better than anybody. Okay, thank you, Pepper. Okay, also you were the last speaker. Scott, how gloomy does it look, or how light does it look at this moment? Well, I think Trump is smart enough to realize that if he picks a fight or a war with Iran and results in Americans being killed, he will be terminated as president. The Congress has also written a letter saying that they uh, are establishing the grounds to impeach him if he takes military action against the government of Iran. Not that the Democrats or, or any of them are noble in any way, but they want to impeach him desperately. So they have put letters out establishing the legal grounds that if he takes any military kinetic action against Iran, he's declaring war and that is solely a congressional authority so i don't think he'll do it because he realizes the democrats would try and impeach him instantly the american people would terminate him he would not be elected again because he was elected to stop the wars primarily and he also may realize he could be uh, assassinated because this is so very serious. This is the culmination of 19 years of war, as Mike Maloof identified. Wars started on a false flag premise of 9-11 that have uh, dominoed and destroyed the world to a large degree. Trump himself has said that. He has admitted his instincts and his observations of the falsity be behind certain elements of, of 9-11. And he cannot backtrack from that. His moral compunction is to not start a war. He's promised that, he said that, and he hates hypocrisy. So hopefully he'll, he'll listen to his own words. But plan A is for diplomatic, aggressive, aggressive, aggressive third-party meetings. Plan B is to create a military alliance with Turkey, Russia, and China, and Iran to stabilize the world. And I think India would come into that too. Okay, okay. Um, I just read something and I'll, I'll share it with you, although we're at the end of the program. I just received news that speaking to reporters in the Oval Office, Trump said he signed an executive order imposing hard-hitting sanctions on Iran that will deny Iran's Supreme Leader Ayatollah Ali Khamenei and others access to financial instruments. This is just breaking news that came out. Were you surprised? None of us are. <laughs> But we knew they were coming. Yeah. We knew the sanctions were coming. We just didn't know what form they took. And, uh, you know, how, how much more can you sanction Iran? It's been so sanctioned already. <laughs> if, I, I don't think it's going to have that much of an effect. Yeah. Okay. So it's more of Trump's. It's more of Trump's having to show some reaction of a of a militancy and aggression. And this is the only way you can do it without allowing bombs and bullets to fly. Okay. Yeah. You, Pepe. Good cop, bad cop routine all over again. And sometimes he plays both. In fact, he prefers to play both. <laughs> okay, listen, thank you so much. I really enjoy talking to all three of you, and God bless you. Thank you so much, Mike. We're going to get you on Skype next time. I'm, My pleasure. Thank yes. you. Yes. Take, take good care. Take take good hopefully, care. Inshallah. Yeah, inshallah. 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 <laughs> okay, Pepe. Okay, Scott. Thank you so much. God bless you. We'll see you around. Take care. Take care. Goodbye. Thank you. God bless. Bye-bye. Thank you for watching the show. 
peace and love to you all.